Welcome, everybody, and thank you for listening and watching the last in our Potential Over Polish speaker series. Um, absolutely delighted to have with us the guest I've most been looking forward to speaking to throughout this whole thing, which is Andy Haldane. I don't think he needs much of an introduction, but for those very few of you who don't know who he is, he was a, a longtime servant of the Bank of England for, for over 30 years, their chief economist and executive director. And for the last couple of years, he's been the CEO of the Royal Society of the Arts. Um, and for me, one of the key inspirations for us launching our uh, social mobility work stream at, at the Diversity Project, the sort of things that he's spoken about in terms of building teams and why it's important. So really, really pleased to speak to him today. So welcome, Andy, and thank you very much for, uh, for taking the time to speak to us. Well, thank you, David, for that lovely introduction uh, and thrilled to be having this conversation uh, with you about these topics. Brilliant. Well, can we start off, and I kind of always try and start off with this type of thing, is really why are you interested in diversity in general and socio-economic diversity in particular? One thing I read in your open letter when you left the bank was uh, that you were speaking about the well-trodden path from a, a Sunderland council estate to Threadneedle Street. So uh, I wonder if that's some of the, uh, the inspiration, if not all. Uh, it is. I mean, inevitably, we're all slightly prisoners of our past, and I'm, I'm sure I'm no exception uh, to that rule. But, you know, like like lots of other people um, working in this space, um, uh, our interest is piqued, at least in part, by our own personal experience and personal journey. And I did start, indeed, at a son of the cancer state, and I spent most of my time growing up um, in, uh, in West Yorkshire, modest background. Um, parents and family who hadn't, you know, um, gone to university, or in, in my case, hadn't actually um, set on up prayer levels either. Um, and I suppose as you, as you track that through yourself, um, I mean, the notion of me as a, I don't know, a 14 year old ending up at the Bank of England would have sounded laughably fanciful, fanciful to be honest. Um, I'm probably still pinching myself, David, 20 or 30 years in. I still probably had a degree of um, um, imposter syndrome even then, to be honest. Oh, um, yeah. As it turns out, that probably wasn't a bad thing at all. Um, that um, I almost felt myself you know, able to operate with a bit more latitude, to operate in that intrapreneurial way within the institution. Um, because I felt as if I had at least one foot slightly outside the institution the whole time. So I don't think remotely it, it got in my way, but for many other people, it plainly does. The evidence could not be clearer that for many people, you know, their history is their destiny to, to far too great an extent. So I think certainly in, in, in my case, and indeed not just me, but maybe as much, David, those I grew up around, my friends when growing up, you know, because I I got lucky, I suppose, and and, and um, ended up down a path that did lead me to Threadneedle Street. I had many, many friends, you know, doubtless many much smarter than me, um, that didn't follow that path. Uh, and that felt like an opportunity lost for them and indeed for the economy at large, uh, society at large. So yeah, that definitely important driver, probably the single most important driver for this topic being of enduring interest to me. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, we, we did a, a speaker series, well, one of the sessions of the speaker series recently, and one of the things that came up with those sort of sliding doors moments where people have been successful kind of think, do you know what, actually, as, as hard as they worked and as much as they took every opportunity going, there was so much luck involved, it kind of frightens them to think about it, how they could have just missed that particular tube train and had to get on the next one and got nowhere near where they ended up. Um, so, yeah, it's amazing, to, given the community you've had to hear that, that that's kind of the case for you too, and that you, even a couple of decades into one of the most high-profile, you know, uh, institutions uh, quite frankly, that you still had some of that, that um, imposter syndrome. What I did want to ask as well is actually throughout that time at the bank, did you notice, well, what did you notice when you first arrived there in terms of your you know, diversity? How did you feel versus everyone else? And, and how did that change over time, how the bank maybe itself approached putting its teams together and so on? 
Well, in some ways, even me going to the bank was itself a, um, uh, if not an accident, it was certainly a lucky moment. It was a sliding doors moment because um, I think prior to that time, um, the mainstay of the bank's graduate intake had come from Oxbridge. They hadn't necessarily um, uh, taken huge numbers of people from a red brick university. And I, I went to a red brick university. Um, and it was also a time actually when they were focusing a bit more on hiring people with technical skills. Um, so those were two lucky coincidences. All of a sudden they were looking beyond the um, um, uh, the Oxbridge um, community and beyond um, some of the, whether it's the classics, or whatever, to, to a, a broader set of uh, disciplines. And, and I suppose I took both boxes around that time. So that was an accident. That was that was just a lucky, a piece of luck that yeah. um, they were reaching out to a broader audience at the time I was, um, at the time I was uh, searching. Truth be told, I mean, the bank I landed in um, a long time ago, this is very end of the 1980s, early 1990s, was with hindsight a pretty extraordinary place. Um, um, you know, as you might imagine, quite hierarchical um, with its own norms, none of which were norms to me, of course, social norms to me remotely, its own language, its own language, bankees. Um, littered with Latin. I wasn't great. Latin, <laughs> to say the least. Um, and, um, you know, I think as I said in that speech that you kindly mentioned, um, this was like landing on a different planet, really. Um, um, I mean, the good news is that the bank had begun to change. And over the course of my lengthy period there, did change really quite fundamentally, um, certainly in terms of its intake um, and its approach to uh, diversity and transparency and uh, embracing both of those things with, um, with open arms. Um, so it was a, you know, for an institution that's typically felt to be old, which it is, uh, and stuffy, which it is not, um, the bank has gone through a pretty significant shift uh, over my time, very, very much for the better in taking these issues seriously and putting them um, front and center in acting, I hope, and this was always my hope, as a bit of a, as a, bit of a leader, as a bit of a catalyst, certainly within the financial services sector, for change um, on this front. So, you know, the bank is unrecognizable and overwhelmingly for the better when it comes to its people composition now versus then when it comes to its cultures and social norms now uh, versus then. And there's no one person can make that happen. It's a it's a thousand and one people doing little things over time, and, and that's what's that's the way it's worked at the bank. Well, that's amazing to hear, and I can I can only imagine actually the sort of late eighties environment, walking in there, having been. I mean, it's it's just going to the city generally must be quite crazy. I mean, I remember the first time I went there, how you know just looking up and just the whole environment. But going into that, that institution in particular, maybe Lloyd's of London is maybe the only other thing I'd think of would be. You know, back going up to that boardroom at the top, so it would be something similar, but still not really anywhere near. Um, before we move on to what you've done more recently, um, you mentioned that speech, and I mentioned that speech, um, and it is one of my favourite kind of things that have been said, quite frankly, about diversity. And it's because you bring, I suppose you call it portfolio choice theory, to the idea of building teams. Now, I try and explain this, I, your words, to people all the time and do an absolutely horrendous job at it. So while I have you, I'd like, if you if you don't mind, if you could explain the, just the general principle of what that means and, and, and the sort of example that you use when you talk about it, that's okay. Yeah, um, I'm sure you don't do a horrific job at all, David, um, but I'll, I'll give you my um, 
give you my shot. And of course, um, you don't have to be an expert in portfolio choice to get the principle here, um, uh, which is essentially that, you know, as beguilingly attractive as let's choose the best person for the job is, it turns out it's completely wrong. Um, because almost everything in life, certainly um, any organization, um, any complex environment, um, is of necessity a, a team sport. It requires a collective uh, effort. Uh, and therefore what matters is not the skills that you bring to this particular job, but the skills you bring to this particular team, how it sits uh, alongside the skills that others in that team have in that diverse and eclectic range uh, needed to, to complete any uh, team-based activity or uh, complex, um, uh, complex task. So um, I said, that sounds beguilingly simple. Um, of course, it's not straightforward uh, to do in practice to ask the question, not just is this person the right fit for this particular job, but how do their skills sit alongside all other members of the team? Are they complement? Yeah, I'm not saying that's easy, yeah. but ultimately those are the decisions and choices we need to be making if we want the team as well as the individual to play the most effective role. There's no incompatibility incompatibility here between what's right for the individual, what's right for the team. Uh, to be a fit, they need to be the right fit for the team and not just for the job. Um, when it comes to, you know, um, diversity, you know, huge focus on recruitment, which is often about fitness for the job uh, and relatively less on inclusivity which is fitness for the team, yeah. for the organization. That's why it really matters. Getting people in the door actually is the relatively less difficult part. Having them feel at home, having them feel they are genuinely part of the team is absolutely the key. And that's why you know, many organizations that are doing well at recruitment are doing really poor at progression and retention and therefore aren't really turning the dial when it comes to diversity and the only way or among the ways you can make both bits work is by hiring for fit for the team and organization rather than for the four corners of the job does that make sense it does i think it also probably means that you need to know your teams really well and the skill sets that are in there to make sure that you know what the gap is and it's not just let's hire the person that's most like the best person in our team and actually you've already got one of those um, maybe you need maybe you need someone else i guess is what you're what you're kind of saying to to round out, especially in, in, suppose in, in investing in this sector, where you're looking across the world, uh, you're looking at politics, you're looking at fundamental value, you're looking at all sorts of stuff that affects um, what you do. And it's, I suppose it's not just one type of person with one type of intellect that, that's going to get you the right answers. Ultimately. No, I mean, ultimately, you know, just to, to bring your point out there, um, and this is just kind of one dimension, uh, for gauging the skills and attributes someone has. Um, but, you know, if you were doing a Myers-Briggs on someone's personality type for a job, it'd be as important to know the Myers-Briggs types of all the team you're hiring into as that of the person that you're um, uh, hiring, actually. In, that's a technique I've actually used myself uh, in the workplace at various uh, at various times. And, you know, that, that's a relatively small tweak, but a, a relatively important tweak. And it's still not the remotely the, the mainstream where we think about this uh, when it comes to workplace hiring and, uh, and progression. And so to your point, even if you do get that, you do that and you get them in, it is about making sure they can add value and progress well. And that brings us on nicely, actually, to your most recent uh, involvement in this area, or certainly the, the highest profile part of it, which is your involvement in the City of London Corporation's Task Force on Socioeconomic Diversity, which 
clearly, and I'm biased here hugely, doing a fantastic job, obviously, of raising uh, the, the sort of awareness uh, of, of the issue that, that I really care about. Um, can you tell us how you came about being involved? And actually, because I know there were multiple work streams going on, what specifically you were, you were involved in? Yeah, very happy to, uh, David. So, um, and as you say, it's uh, the social mobility, indeed the diversity um, issues are ones I've um, um, tried to make a contribution towards over a number of years uh, now across all their dimensions, uh, actually. Um, I mean, it turns out that one of the stickiest of uh, the diversity problems uh, has been the social mobility one. Um, I mean, perhaps it's been relatively less focused on than some of the others, at least of late. Uh, that's not saying, by the way, that the others are remotely fixed, because they're not, but it's one that's had relatively less focus on it. Yeah. And we know, and we know uh, at the sort of national level, um, that um, on any of the metrics of social mobility, um, we have, ha at best as a country, been standing still and might even have been going backwards uh, over the most recent um, uh, several decades. Indeed, I mean, there, there is some evidence that suggests we haven't really moved forward much at all for several centuries, never, never mind several decades. So whether you cut the cake empirically, it looks like um, we start in a not great position uh, and have not obviously been improving very much. Uh, and what is true at the level of um, the country as a whole uh, is particularly true of certain uh, sectors or segments uh, of the country. Um, I mean, the, the professions stand out for all the wrong reasons on this front. Uh, and within that, uh, the financial sector, where I've spent the you know, majority of my life, um, singularly so, so I think the opportunity uh, when I was asked to do something one um, purposive in the social mobility space, but two with a focus on the financial and professional services sector was too good an opportunity to to pass up uh, in the hope, you know, to basically mobilize some action, to get something going, to shine a light on what was self-evidently um, a problem, a problem of long standing, but which was not solving itself and therefore needed a, a, a nudge or even a shove to get started. So that was the motivation, really, David. Yeah. And um, given your, your kind of experience and your focus, it was the kind of productivity angle that you were, you were looking most at. Is that right? It was. So um, I didn't answer the second part of your question. Uh, apologies. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the task force was um, spread across three work streams, um, which were co-chaired by uh, Vincent Keevney, who's the uh, mayor of London, or was until recently. Um, Sandra Wallace, formerly a co-chair of the Social Mobility Commission, uh, and myself, and my strand of that was really about um, one, establishing in as clear cut a way as possible the empirical case here, you know, what is the evidence base? Um, and two, uh, making off the back of that, the commercial case alongside the evidence base. So um, what were the fruits that could be picked in terms of um, business efficiency and productivity and innovation and contribution from making inroads on the levels of social mobility in those organizations. That was essentially my essay question. Um, slightly nerdy essay question, but then again, I am slightly nerdy. So it was, it was the right attribution of tasks, I think, David. I understood yeah. it at least, so that's probably a good sign. It wasn't kind of been that nerdy, <laughs> but I understood it. And um, I mean, on that, um, I mean, the feeling was, I think rightly, that, um, you know, what turns the heads of organizations or leaders of organizations uh, differs, right? So um, for some, the, you know, the inequities, the social justice case for social mobility is strong enough for want them to, 
to take action and say, look, that's just wrong. That's not fair. Businesses are ultimately social constructs. Yeah. Almost everything's a social construct, by the way. But businesses plainly are. Uh, and therefore, as such, you know, to make good on our social contract, we need to, we need to do a better job to, to tackle this unfairness. For some, that's enough. And, and many said on during the course of our task force deliberations, David, you know, I don't need to see the commercial case being made. It's enough for me to know that what we're doing isn't right and isn't fair. Yeah. But that isn't everyone. Uh, and the case becomes you know, stronger still um, when you can bring to bear some evidence on how this is not just the wrong thing to do in some moral sense, but it's a pretty, pretty nutty thing to be doing commercially as well. You're leaving money on the table by not doing a better job of um, having an organization that's properly diverse along the socioeconomic dimensions as well as the other dimensions that matter hugely uh, as well. And, you know, my work stream was essentially building out the case for, for, for why that might be so. And indeed, putting a few numbers to how much money was indeed being left on the table by not doing a better job uh, on this front. Uh, and for me, you know, the fact that we have this sort of pincer movement, you can do the social justice thing or you can do the economic efficiency thing, really then made the case um, compelling, if not watertight, to any leader looking in um, and saying, what's this all about? That's interesting, because I think over time, there's often been criticisms of sort of studies of business cases for certain aspects of diversity, because maybe they look at earnings of a company or the share price and don't account for the sector, you can look at energy companies and the oil, the oil price is going to have a lot more to do with it than what you're doing, how, what, what, what the composition of your board is probably, um, and so on. So it's quite interesting, actually, that you've managed to look at it from a different angle and not look at certain things like that. Um, and the other thing that struck me was, and I'm sure it doesn't happen like this, but I suppose we could all walk around our organisations and see to a degree how gender diverse we are or whether we have any sort of ethnic and, and racial diversity at all. It's, quite hard to see the socioeconomic angle, right? So I think um, we can pretend quite easily that everything's fine, <laughs> you know, optically, without grabbing the data um, as well. So as much as it's the right thing to do, no, no one's feeling, feeling guilty day to day because they can't see the problem, right? So the social justice angle. So it's quite nice that you've managed to give it the, the commercial edge as well. And after all, most financial and professional services companies are very commercially minded. So I'd imagine that that persuasion is, 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 is very timely and, and, and needed in some instances. I mean, you're quite right. I mean, if nothing else, um, however purposeful the leader, uh, they need to know and need to justify to their board uh, and shareholders that they're not pursuing some moral cause that would overtly do damage to their earnings and share price. So there has to be a kind of do no harm element to this. Yeah. Um, if you are to convince uh, others that are your masters and bosses, that you're not um, doing damage to the commercial objectives of the organization. In fact, uh, you know, for me, having sifted that evidence, um, we need not be that cautious. You know, this, is, this comes at a commercial advantage, not disadvantage from pursuing this course. So in, in that way, this feels um, like a twin win. I mean, your point about data and transparency is absolutely right, David, uh, of course, that you know, many organizations, you know, when pressed on this, you know, of course, every organization has examples of, of people having made it through, right? Yeah. Often, sometimes it's them, of course. Sometimes it's them. Um, but that doesn't mean it's a full and accurate lens on the whole organization. And we didn't have that full and accurate lens. And one of the aims of the task force was to provide a, a, a much clearer and more comprehensive lens on the state of organizations when it came to that um, often invisible dimension of, uh, of diversity. Um, I should say on the commercial case as well, it's quite interesting 
I mean, the way we tackled it really wasn't just through, you know, the lens of, you know, what is the down, what evidence is there on the downstream impact of socioeconomic diversity on uh, incomes or profits or earnings per share. I mean, that is one dimension, but um, we explored also the more sort of earlier pipeline ways in which this could really benefit an organization. So let me make that concrete. I mean, one of the most um, resonant channels just at the moment um, is, um, is staffing, is staffing. So there is a war for talent uh, underway. That is my dog in the background, by the way, adding a degree oh. of authenticity to my- I didn't want to look behind me to make sure it wasn't in my background, but I'm glad it's in yours. <laughs> The um, so um, at the moment there's a you know there's a, what a, a million unfilled vacancies in the UK. Everyone is short of people. Everyone is short of skills. Uh, there is that war for talent. Um, where are we to find it? Where are we to find it? Well, it turns out it is there under our noses, hiding in plain sight, provided we think about the recruitment process who we want to, in a slightly broader, slightly more eclectic, slightly more inclusive way than we have. Um, so whether it's the, at the, you know, the very earliest stages of the organizational pipeline, which is hiring recruitment, or whether it's you know, within the sausage machine, the process of innovation, we know that diversity is absolutely the wellspring of innovation and creativity which again, any organization worth its salt right now is crying out for that uh, as a way of um, achieving some you know, commercial advantage. Or it's the end of the pipeline, which is where does this show up in how much we earn or how much we distribute to shareholders. It works at all points in the pipeline. And we, we, we sought to bring together the evidence base at all points in the pipeline um conscious that you know different strokes for different folks many a, a different evidence base for different audiences to convince them to do the right thing what were the key kind of findings or, or, or recommendations one thing i'm thinking is um you see some of the, the, the industries and sectors we're talking about here tend to be london and southeast focused um quite a lot of socioeconomic inequality can happen regionally as well so i don't my personal view at the very least is we don't do a fantastic job of attracting people from other parts of the, the UK into our industry. Um, was that one of the uh, sort of findings and what, what were the others? I guess I, you could probably split that question into what was the, the output, the evidence, and then what was the what were the, the recommendations on, on the back of it? Yeah, I mean, just on, on, on the evidence, um, in some ways that was um, uh, doing no more and no less than reinforcing and amplifying what were either our hunches or which pre or what pre-existing evidence was already showing, oh, yeah. um, which was significant uh, inequalities and in opportunities and outcomes uh, among people from poorer backgrounds, if I can use that uh, shorthand, um, that those differences were significantly more acute in the financial and professional services sectors than in other sectors. So that, you know, finance and the professions um, did even less well than others uh, in making good on uh, this. The progress, uh, insofar as you could discern it, was either very slow or possibly stalled. And the final point is on the evidence base, David, which is actually really important, I think, um, is if you ask people about their perceptions of this, um, they are, you know, even more striking the actual data. So people have a sort of fatalism about this always being the case. They know the landscape is uh, not right. They know the playing field is not level, um, but they don't have a sense it'll get better anytime soon. And I mentioned that because that risks becoming self-fulfilling. Yeah. You know, people think there isn't a level playing field. Kind of why bother playing on that playing field then, right? Yeah, makes sense. The perceptions 
matter, I think, every bit as much as the hard evidence when it comes to understanding the problem we face. But unless you start not just re-tilting the playing field, but shifting perceptions of the playing field tilting, you won't get the invent. We get people sticking uh, rather than twisting. They'll go do something else. They'll yeah. say, this is not for me. I don't feel at home. I mean, when I was, you know, when, when I'd speak to people leaving the Bank of England about why they'd left, um, not kind of formal exit interviews, but just sort of conversations, really. Um, and the numbers of times, David, I'd hear the words, um, there aren't enough people here like me. And they didn't mean necessarily gender or ethnicity. Um, it was more a general sense of with interests similar to mine, with values similar to mine. Yeah. Um, and that's the perceptional thing. You know, do I feel at home here? Can I be myself here? Can I take off my mask when I come here? That's it interesting, because there may have been a few people like them, they just would never know, right? Because everyone's fitting a predetermined culture that you all feel you need to fit in, so you can't do your best in that environment or be, a, exactly. be yourself necessarily. So the, and the evidence was, you know, it was a open and shut case. You know, anyone who said, oh, you know, that evidence interesting, but we need a bit more evidence. No, we don't. No, we don't. The jury is in. It's absolutely nailed on. Uh, let's crack on and do something about it, right? Yeah. That, that's what well, that established. We had the bridge group, didn't you? Um, sorry to interrupt very briefly. We had the bridge group uh, just a handful of years ago come out, and I think their stats were something like nine out of 10 senior leaders um, in financial services are from higher socioeconomic backgrounds. And it took 25% longer to progress if you're from a lower socioeconomic background, regardless of any performance issues. So you do the same work, you same quality, still take it still took according to 25 percent longer to progress so i mean that alone is, is very striking i know that building the baseline report that came out of the city of london corporation was an even bigger study i think it was nine thousand employees across 49 firms um, and has some quite striking statistics as well and anyone watching or listening can grab that from the progress together website i think it's worth a skim even just the first couple of pages of that there's some quite cool infographics there that will show you some of that, that uh, those numbers that you were alluding to well, uh, and thanks for um, flagging those things, David. Um, you remember the numbers better than me, which is even better. Um, but yeah, I mean, the evidence is there. The Bridge Group report you mentioned was um, made the case very clearly and compellingly. And I hope our survey added to that. As I say, I think now um, we know enough. We know more than enough to take action. That goes to the second part of your question, really, which is what action was taken. Uh, off the back of that. Um, well, in some ways, the actions we sought to take were sort of following a path already uh, well trodden by some of the other dimensions of diversity, gender and ethnicity in particular. So, you know, given that this is a largely invisible attribute, the first place to start is to make the invisible visible within organizations uh, and to do a much better job um, of uh, regularly and comprehensively surveying um, the attributes of the organization and that uh, we had as one of our key recommendations that um, uh, all those taking part um, signed up to do this on a, on a regular and routine basis and crucially um, sought over time to publish the results of that so there was a clear line of sight and transparency we could be held to account for that and indeed then to use that David, uh, as the basis for some target setting within organizations to do better so that progress could not just be uh, monitored over time, but progress relative to target could be monitored over time to set some aspirational targets at both the individual firm level and at the sector level to move the dial progressively over time uh, towards uh, yeah, towards a situation where um, organizations socioeconomically are a mirror image of the society they serve. We're a, we're a country mile away from that right now. But that's the long-term objective. But because it's 
a speck on the horizon right now, setting some intermediate objectives at the organization and sector level, I think we felt were really important. And we did that as part of the, the program of change. So data collection systematically, transparency about the data collection, the setting of targets, both the ind individual firm and sector wide level, and then clear accountability after the fact. What are individual firms doing if they are falling short of their own uh, aspirational targets? So um, those are the key elements of action, collective action um, that emerged from the report. I mean, my hope, maybe this is always my hope in public policy, um, David, is that you get some first movers you get yeah. some disruptors that would basically blaze a trail on this front, which as well as providing a path for others to follow, also provides a bit of a nudge for others to get on with it. Uh, so they're not seen to be uh, falling too far behind or even dragging them. That's interesting that you say that, Andy, uh, because... Back of this. So I just had a, there was a little break in the thing though, I didn't realize you were still speaking, but that was interesting that you said that about the sort of first movers because somebody used the analogy with me once on that about how, you know, once you get a few people doing that, you'd be surprised how the rest come. And they, they used this, I think it was the Tour de France, but certainly cycling where they said, you need a few people to make a breakaway. Peloton panic and try and catch up and no one wants to drop out of the Peloton, right? So, you know, you've got this, hopefully this huge swathe of riders or in this case companies chasing those first few that have made a break for it. Um, which makes me think, you know, recently, well, certainly in the last year, 18 months, we have seen some professional services firms, so thinking people like KPMG, PwC, um, and so on, come out with some, but firstly, being quite transparent, and certainly the stuff that I've seen, there's been a lot of press around, you know, we want a certain amount of um, directors or partners um, to be from a, from, a, from a lower socioeconomic background or certainly more representative of society. Would you say that, professional services are leading the way or is there anyone leading the way or anyone lagging? I don't want to, certainly not calling out companies, more sort of parts of the, the uh, ecosystem of financial and professional services. I, well, I think the example you give is a, is, is a very good one. And that would be my example as well, that, you know, I think within, within professional services, um, which of course, historically, you know, traditionally is felt to be some way back on this front. I mean, professional services, you know, classically, were the, you know, they were the bulk buyers of Russell Group graduates, right? Yeah. Um, and um, they have gone from, you know, towards the back of the peloton, to use your metaphor, right to sort of yellow jersey status um, now, um, which shows, one, it's feasible. Um, you know, this is within a sector, you know, that... that as its name suggests, prides itself on its professionalism, right? Um, um, it's uh, uh, it's fantastic that in, in some ways that is casting a sector that was seen in a very different way into a fundamentally different light. So it feels more striking because of the distance they've traveled from towards the back to towards the, uh, towards the front. In their case, if you speak to some of the firms you mentioned and others besides that tell you um this to a degree was born of necessity back to that war for talent where are we to unearth the riches in this super hyper competitive market for people um well um by seeking out and nurturing the skills that um that exist but currently are being well hidden um by recruitment processes uh, or by certain gateways, you know, which is which might be the university you went to, might be the class of degree that you got, may have even have been the A-levels that you took. And it turns out these are unhelpful barriers to getting great people. Yeah. Um, and that's what they would absolutely tell you, that they are unearthing diamond after diamond after diamond. Um, and they're delighted about having taken this path. You know, they've done it. You know, partly with either social justice, but they are seeing the commercial payoffs from this already. Um, so um, I think they are showing the way. Uh, and the fact that they've been able to do it at scale 
they are a niche employer, right? The biggest employer of, historically, the biggest employer of graduates in the country. Yeah. Um, I think that shows that if they can do it from the back of the peloton, so can anyone else. Yeah, I think that's true. What, what worries me about the sort of small part of financial services that I'm in, which is basically investment and savings asset management, is that when you look at things like the um, social mobility uh, foundations, employers index, so they do a, uh, who's, who's the best at social mobility, basically, or who's, you look at the top 20 or 30, and we're just not in there. So there are government departments in there, there's professional services firms, there are law firms starting to come up, and it's, I've been watching this over time, just seeing, you know, and these people clearly are taking your point on talent and, and know that they're out there to compete. So it used to be, I think, that, you know, you might find a, an asset manager competing with an asset manager, another asset manager in their minds for talent, but actually they're competing with a broader range of entities altogether, maybe outside of financial professional services. And I wonder now if um, people have in their minds at least more options about where they want to go and, and, and feel at home at. Um, so yeah, that's one of the reasons, of course, why the diversity project is taking this so seriously, because we don't have the, um, the sort of uh, high tech type products it's, it's the people are the, the, the assets really aren't they um, and then they, they deliver the, the products so it's, it's it's very interesting what you say and i'm hoping over the next few years we see more of those um firms starting to register in the, at the top of those social mobility and socioeconomic diversity lists um well, like I mean, professional ones. well it'd be great if that was the case and i hope the task force work provides a bit of a giddy up to that i hope it does um I also hope, though, because all nudges help, that um, well, one that government can show the way a little itself, and some government departments are. You mentioned those that have uh, been front running on on, on this, uh, but also that they, you know, that they ask questions of this type in the course of, for example, their pr procurement if they're working with businesses. Yeah, you know, government are big buyers of services and goods. Uh, and them asking some questions about the, the makeup of the organizations from whom they're purchasing these goods and services um, be one way in which they can exert a degree of soft influence over this uh, agenda, which I hope they do. That falls short of regulation, which I know um, is, a, is a high hurdle, but it nudges in the same direction. So they can show that government can show the way uh, and government can exercise its soft power to encourage others to to follow suit and the final way which speaks directly to uh to the finance sector of course david is if uh, investors in companies begin to sit up and pay a little bit more attention to this in a way this is one dimension of the s in esg you know the e's got quite a bit of focus and rightly so that it has i mean Again, we're not there, but you have a sense that the, the, the ground is moving on the E. Uh, the S, by contrast, is often quite silent. It's often quite silent, the, the S that's social in the SG. Yeah. And this would be one important dimension of the uh, silent S in ESG. Uh, and that is a place, you know, looking ahead, why you would hope the investment community can sit up and pay a bit more attention ask some more probing questions of those they are investing their money in. I mean, it's the ultimate irony to pick up your point from a few minutes ago that, you know, any company, hard to find a company on the planet that didn't say its greatest asset was its staff. Yeah, that's a fair point. And how much reporting on that greatest asset takes place. You, there's endless reporting on every other asset on the balance sheet, but not the asset they claim is their most important one. Yeah. Um, how does that figure? How does that work? How does Especially that work? for industries that are actually obsessed with data in pretty much every other sense as well. It's, it's, it's quite mad if you think about it, isn't it? It's, um, and, and to your point on sort of procurement and using of services, I think the investment industry is kind of going out there and telling other companies and other sectors, hey, fix up, sort yourselves out. You know, we're, we're, we're here to sort of do our sort of shareholder and stakeholder engagement with you. But I suppose they've got to kind of uh, walk the walk themselves as well. Uh, I know, of course, as part of the diversity project, there is a thing called the Asset Owners Charter now. Uh, it's about to, I think, include some socioeconomic things, but it's essentially the investment consultants, pension funds and asset owners coming together and saying, look, actually, if you're going to manage our money for us, we want to know 
this about you. Firstly, we want to know that you're measuring it and we want to know how you're improving it over time. So some of those, it's really good to see that some of those things are happening. To your point, I think it's when the heads of sales start running to the CEO saying, hey, uh, I'm, I'm not able to compete for this business. You might see um, you might see the dial move a bit more quickly, hopefully. Well, we live in hope on that. I mean, there's, there's, there's um, there isn't, as you found on the other dimensions of diversity that are so important, there isn't a single nudge that will get you to the promised land on this. It needs to come from multiple sources on a consistent basis to have the dial moving. And that includes uh, businesses themselves owning it. It includes uh, government demonstrating it and nudging it. Um, uh, it includes the investment community um, either encouraging or better still requiring it. Um, and there are bits of movements on all those fronts, David, but it's not yet a torrent. It's still a trickle. And it needs to become a torrent. If you were going to, this is probably not an easy question, albeit a simple one. If you were going to say to companies, if there's one thing you're going to, you should do today to start kind of getting towards a torrent collectively, what would it be? Would it be the data thing? So does sunlight the best disinfectant type scenario? I think um, as arid as it sounds, um, without that, um, you know, companies find it difficult to confront the scale of the challenge. So I, I do think you need line of sight on where you start. Uh, I mean, there's an understandable, understandable fearfulness in many companies. Um, uh, one about um, this is another thing, right? Oh, where will it all end? We're reporting on everything under the sun. We're being asked to... Um, you know, to tap our head and rub our tummy and stand on one leg all at the same time, you know, to hop as well is just too much in this uncertain environment. And I kind of I understand that, you know, I kind of get that, that people are slightly frazzled by the environment and by the um, ever expanding reporting and regulatory rule book. Uh, I kind of get that. Um, so I think the, the lightest touch and the hope least scary way in would be, well, you want to know your business, surely. You want to know your people, surely. Um, and that ought not to be a burdensome thing. That's just the sort of management information you'd always want to run your business well, is it not? And I think once you get firms over that obstacle, it then becomes easier to have a more purposive conversation about what's to be done. Yeah. Uh, given 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 where you are. Now, I found during this task force where, you know, again, <laughs> unsurprisingly, and I think not unreasonably, there was a degree of re resistance to the, certainly the publishing of data and certainly the publishing of targets. And some of that was just born, born out of fearfulness. You know, if you don't know where you start from, then someone setting you an ambitious target is scary. I might be yeah. miles away. Yeah. <laughs> and I have no chance of jumping to the moon when I've scarcely got off the earth. <laughs> um, so I kind of get that. And I think the, the, the way to sort of break down those understandable barriers or fears of the unknown is to make less of it unknown. <laughs> um, and, that, and that's a data thing as boring as that might sound um, it starts you on the journey and there's lots of firms haven't started yet on the journey and I, I'm very conscious that those around my task force table were themselves self-selected right they opted in because they want to do something Yeah. but you know, as a more important are those that didn't opt in and need encouraging um and some of that is stick that's the trailblazers shaming them yeah so that has to be carrot you know this yeah. is to help you run your business yeah no very wise words and totally agree with all of that i'm very conscious of, of the time that we have left um one thing i wanted to ask you before we go though is because of course you're most well known for being at the bank of england for so long and by the way before i ask this Anyone who hasn't read Andy's open letter 
um, when he left. It's, it's such a fascinating read. I was just reading about the, uh, the, the, the Sterling crisis and how young you must have been at the time and what position to be in. Just that paragraph alone is mind-blowing just to imagine it. So have a read of that. But you are now uh, the CEO of the Royal Society of the Arts. Um, how Obviously a huge departure. How has that been? And because we're talking about diversity, what are your, I mean, I suppose if you ask many people about the arts, some people would be like, well, actually, that's the ultimate kind of leveller, an equaliser, anyone can be involved in art. But if you ask other people, they'll say, well, actually, well, arts are quite stuffy, that, you know, that's not for me. So, yeah, how have you found it and, and, and what's your perception been versus uh, the reality and so on? Reality versus perception. Yeah, thanks, David. Well, I mean, um, I love the bank and we'll always love the bank uh, and you can't spend 32 years in any one place and, and not be deeply institutionalised and I always will be and I make no apologies uh, for that and I have no regret about spending one minute at the bank, actually. It was, it was amazing. I loved it. I'm loving the new place too. Um, they're not as similar as you think. I mean, they're both ancient institutions. The RSA is only 270 years old uh, <laughs> next year, but still, you know, cracking on. Um, they both serve the public. That's what they're both there to, to do. Uh, and the RSA's case, as I say, that's been uh, since the middle of the 18th century. Uh, our agenda is, is is actually much broader than the name sometimes suggests. So it's social change in, in all its dimensions. Our full title is the Royal Society of Arts, Manufactures and Commerce. So it's overtly straddling the sectors, overtly straddling um, the professions and the disciplines. Um, and since the get go, um, uh, inclusive. So everyone's been welcome since the get go. Um, which is very unusual for 18th century London institutions <laughs> to, to, to operate in that way. And the reason it operated that way, um, it takes us right back to the topic of today's conversation. It was a recognition born out of the enlightenment, out of the 18th century coffee house culture, that it is by bringing together people from different backgrounds, from different professions, from different disciplines, sticking them, in this case, in a coffee house off the strand. Magic happens. Innovation happens. Social change happens when you bring together that diverse and eclectic mix of individuals, well-meaning individuals, to affect change. So in some ways, the RSA is the institutional embodiment of all of today's conversation, David, of the power of diversity across all its dimensions to do social good, to nurture innovation and entrepreneurship and social change. And that might be, you know, uh, the first, so we initiated the first mass tree plantation program uh, in the UK in the 18th century. 60 million trees we planted in the 18th century. The foundation stone of conservationism globally was found at the RSA in the 18th century. And we've been initiating the first examinations in state schools, which were an RSA uh, initiative. Or it could oh. be, you know, slightly smaller scale things, more recent things like, um, like the blue plaques you see uh, around uh, the country or the fourth plinth at Trafalgar Square. But the keystone uh, back in 1754 and the keystone uh, in 2022 uh, and 2023 will be built on the same foundations, which is social connectivity and diversity as the wellspring of creativity, innovation, and social change. Uh, so I hope through the RSA, we are uh, the living embodiment of the diversity project and the living embodiment of all matters diversity because we've been showing that's the right recipe for getting on for three centuries. Wow, that's fantastic. And I've, I learned a fair bit there that I embarrassingly didn't, didn't already know. That's uh, that coffee house culture. The idea that diversity isn't just about it for the sake of it. It's about these ideas and ingenuity and innovation. And you know, we need to do that to survive, right? And thrive as, a, as, a, as an industry. One great thing, I mean, to be fair to the financial professional services industry, they have been great innovators over time. It's just 
what are they leaving on the table by not by not doing this ultimately um fantastic that that's been such a, a wonderful conversation thank you so much for sparing the time um as i said at the start this is the last in our potential over polish series but all of them except for the first will be available on on demand on our on our website uh, via youtube um so, so please catch up with them there and um thanks again and oh by the way check out progress together which is the kind of legacy isn't it of the city of london corporations task force which is a, a membership body that is um, focused on uh, progression uh, and we know don't we that in senior roles and revenue generating roles in this industry is sort of the, the, the crux of the issue so so please check that out if you get the chance thanks again andy really enjoyed that wonderful thank you david really enjoyed our uh, conversation and all the very best with the with the project fantastically important work to be done Brilliant. Thank you.